Welcome to the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast, where we explore the kind of thinking we need to navigate a positive way forward. I'm your host, Maura Gamble, permaculture educator and global ambassador, filmmaker, eco villager, food forester, mother, practivist, and all round lover of thinking, communicating, and acting regeneratively. For a long time, it's been clear to me that to shift trajectory to a thriving one planet way of life, we first need to shift our thinking. The way we perceive ourselves in relation to nature, self and community is the core. So this is true now more than ever. And even the way change is changing is changing. Unprecedented changes are happening all around us at a rapid pace. So how do we make sense of this? To know which way to turn, to know what action to focus on. So our efforts are worthwhile and nourishing and are working towards resilience, regeneration and reconnection. What better way to make sense than to join together with others in open, generative conversation? In this podcast, I'll share conversations with my friends and colleagues, people who inspire and challenge me in their ways of thinking, connecting and acting. These wonderful people are thinkers, doers, activists, scholars, writers, leaders, farmers, educators, people whose work informs permaculture and spark the imagination of of what a post-COVID, climate resilient, socially just future could look like. Their ideas and projects help us to make sense in this changing world, to compost and digest the ideas and to nurture the fertile ground for new ideas, connections and actions. Together we'll open up conversations in the world of permaculture design, regenerative thinking, community action, earth repair, eco-literacy and much more. I can't wait to share these conversations with you. Over the last three decades of personally making sense of the multiple crises we face, I always return to the practical and positive world of permaculture with its ethics of earth care, people care and fair share. I've seen firsthand how adaptable and responsive it can be in all contexts, from urban to rural, from refugee camps to suburbs. It helps people make sense of what's happening around them and to learn accessible design tools to shape their habitat positively and to contribute to cultural and ecological regeneration. This is why I've created the Permaculture Educators Program, to help thousands of people to become permaculture teachers everywhere through an interactive online dual certificate of permaculture design and teaching. We sponsor global perma youth programs, women's self-help groups in the global south and teens in refugee camps. So anyway, this podcast is sponsored by the Permaculture Education Institute and our Permaculture Educators Program. If you'd like to find more about permaculture, I've created a four-part permaculture video series to explain what permaculture is and and also how you can make it your livelihood as well as your way of life. We'd love to invite you to join our wonderfully inspiring, friendly and supportive global learning community. So I welcome you to share each of these conversations and I'd also like to suggest you create a local conversation circle to explore the ideas shared in each show and discuss together how this makes sense in your local community and environment. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I meet and speak with you today, the Gubby Gubby people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Hi everyone, it's my absolute delight to share with you today this conversation with Ego Lemos from Timor Leste. Ego is a humble yet radical positive change maker. He grew up in the tumultuous time of the Indonesian occupation in Timor Leste. And over the decades, he's worked with permaculture to help it mushroom, as he says, throughout his country. He's largely responsible for permaculture being a compulsory subject for every primary school age child in his country. Permaculture is in the national curriculum and it's starting to extend into high schools too. And even since 2011, he's been lecturing in permaculture at the National University. He's launched permakids programs, perma youth camps that since 2008 have have had well over a thousand youth attending whenever they're run. He also runs three-day training programs uh, for uh, teachers of permaculture in schools and he now organizes uh, camps around restoring the upper catchments to help rehydrate the landscape. He's also an advisor to the national government in lots of different sectors. And not only that, Ego is a musician. He ha- his, his song Balibo was awarded a best song composed for the screen uh, in a movie that, was, um, that starred Damon Gamow and Anthony LaPaglia. So 
Ego is a fascinating character who I am absolutely delighted to have spent the time chatting with. We met ages ago at the Permaculture Conference and I'll put a link in where you can find that conversation too where he talks a little bit more too about growing up in the Indonesian occupation. Also just really important to acknowledge too that Timor is a young country with over 70% of the population under 30 years old and actually 70% of the people living in farming areas and it continues to be one of the poorest countries in the world with over 40% of their 1.3 million population living in poverty. So what Ego does in his community is absolutely essential and is making such a positive difference. So um, join me in this conversation and I really hope you can hear much inspiration for how you might be able to help cultivate some amazing local programs in your communities. There were two key questions that I was exploring with Ego. One was, you know, what is Perma Youth and how we got it started? And the other was about what are the kind of resources that he's been able to create through the work that he's done and how that is now being shared out through the world through the Tropical Permaculture Manual, which he was co-author of, a thousand-page manual, which is absolutely extraordinary, um, and also the materials he's developed for schools, the, the handbooks and the posters. So enjoy. I, I hope you'll find a lot of really fantastic inspiration here in this conversation. Regarding uh, the, the permaculture youth uh, in Timor, I think since we start uh, in 2008, uh, uh, the number is, that time is, uh, uh, first camp, about 400 uh, young, 400 youth. But then, now, uh, after, then we have second camp in 2010, it's increased to uh, more than 600 people. And then 2012, it's uh, almost 900 people. And 2015, we same almost uh, a thousand, I think, almost a thousand uh, yeah, youth. And then 2000, 18, 2018, we have over a thousand youth uh, gathered. Uh, and now we preparing for the next one, which we plan in November, uh, 23rd to 28th of November. And so we still target 1,000 uh, youth. <clears throat> But depends on now because of the situation of uh, COVID. So uh, we're not sure yet uh, whether uh, we can gather this number of people, mm. but still a lot, uh, even 500 is a lot. And so during the camp, 
we have about last time 2018 we have about 15 uh workshop in a day so like we we just uh list like uh 15 workshop which is a uh, practical uh, workshop uh, in the field straight in the uh, community uh, land uh, that's one workshop is uh, last for three days so for instance uh, workshop on uh, aquaculture so the the participant with the facilitator they working uh, building a fish pond and also they learn about how to grow fish and uh, also how to combine fish and chicken uh, and uh, vegetable garden and also workshop about uh, cuisine, about cooking. So we invite uh, some Timorese chef to facilitate the, the workshop and they cook, uh, they cook during the, the workshop uh, and different type of recipes. And we also have workshop on water uh, resource conservation. Uh, so the participant with the facilitator, they create like a, a key dam, uh, or we call here we we call uh, like a reservoir, small reservoir which can be uh, dig by hand. So I think uh, during the camp, like three days, they build they maybe up to five uh, reservoir, which is. I think about 10 by 20 meter by one or one and a half. So it's uh, for uh, capture the rainwater during the rain season. So, and the reservoir uh, feeding the spring so that community can access to the uh, clean water. But also they, uh, we have workshop on seed saving. So I could say you, this uh, concept note or two are of the program last one. Uh, that's already in English, but the new one we haven't translated yet. Uh, but I can share you share you with some uh, the concept note for the new camp <laughs> that's uh, gonna come. Uh, so <clears throat> the. The idea is like we building up this uh, kind of uh, camp, and so the participant coming, uh, the you come across the whole country, uh, including we we attract some international participant, but uh, last time not many, uh, but quite uh, mostly people coming from uh, Indonesia, from western part of uh, west, from west uh, west. Timor, uh, the border of Timor. So about more than 20 youth come from Indonesia to join. And if everything goes smoothly, so I think UNESCO, Jakarta, also they interest want to send the youth from Indonesia and the youth from West uh, Timor and the youth from Bali, also they want to uh, join. But we hope uh, that this uh, pandemic is end soon, so that we could, you know, uh, uh, welcome the international uh, participant coming from uh, all over the place. <coughs> and for this uh, next coming uh, camp, we prepare uh, about nine uh, practical workshops uh, <coughs> because in the practical workshop. I think uh, about two or three workshop, which is will uh, uh, like uh, involve more participants. For instance, water source conservation. Water source conservation is uh, we we hoping to get about two hundred or at least one hundred fifty youth involved in that workshop, uh, so that. Then we dividing into three groups, like a 50 
each group so they can build reservoir uh, around the campsite. Uh, and then the other workshop that we're going to recruit same number of people is uh, we call uh, agroforestry and bioengineer, like a building terraces, swells. So they'll go, go along, along with this uh, water conservation. And so because we want we want to uh, scaling up water conservation uh, activities end of the year after the camp. Uh, when rain come, we want all of this youth go back to their uh, uh, respective uh, villages to start doing this kind of activities. And we promise uh, in our new concept note that um, we won't give uh, this uh, youth the certificate um until we see what they're doing so in their own village yeah in their own village mm -hmm. uh, last year we're doing uh training uh 220 uh participants for water conservation from december in two places like uh, each place 60 people and again we apply same rules uh, we won't give them certificate. We give them th three month, three to uh, three month at minimum, for them to apply. After we get the report, we go and see what they're doing. If it's if it's done, then we we produce the certificate for them. Right. The last uh, March, we we gave about maybe hundred. Uh, six or seven hundred six hundred seven certificate to uh, those people who implemented in their uh, areas. So last December to January to February, so we produce the about forty one reservoir across the country. Fantastic! Wow! Yeah. That's such a great model. Absolutely fantastic. So do the kids, how do the kids hear about it? Um, and what age are they? And are they paying for that? Or do you get sponsorship to run this program for them? Like, like practically, how like, is that uh, working? For, for Timor, uh, uh, not, the, uh, not them pay. They don't pay. Uh, but we're looking for sponsorship. Mm -hmm. So... We're looking for sponsorship. We uh, uh, talk to the government and talk to the uh, uh, international agency to uh, cover the cost of the transport, cost of the food, and also uh, yeah, we didn't we we didn't get them uh, pay them, but so they they just uh, participate. And when they finish uh, the training, we. Uh, also provide kind of uh, incentive like uh, food for food so that they go back and involve more people in their respective village to working on the the water uh, resource conservation so like uh, it's more involved like uh, almost thousand people across the country wow. <laughs> like uh, yeah so this kind of uh, <coughs> activities is what we're doing and the age of the group the youth is uh we're targeting uh above 17 years old apart from we have uh, perma youth we also have perma kids so the perma kids camp also uh every two years biannual so that's uh age 12 to 17. so that's why when I look at the the age group that you mentioned, uh, uh, I think for us they part of the uh, kids for my kids. Yeah. For the youth, uh, we pref preferably we are looking for eighteen years old about. Yeah. So that would be uh, perfect because involve uh, like a physical activities more and. Uh, below that, we we, uh, we call uh, uh, they part of the uh, kids, uh, the kids. Uh, perma kids. Yeah. So what do you do? Do you, uh, so on the perma kids camp? Uh, yeah. Is that different from the perma youth 
camp or is it the same thing, but they just do different programs? Burma Kids is uh, more about gardening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, they more about gardening, uh, about cooking, uh, and also games. Like uh, in kids camp, uh, like uh, we prepare breakfast and lunch, but the, the youth, they cook themselves. Uh-huh. So we just provide raw food. Yep. We give them raw food every day. Uh, they cook uh, breakfast and lunch. Uh, last time lunch is uh, we uh, prepare in the community where they work. And then the after, in the afternoon, they come back to the campsite and they cook for dinner. So, so we organize. This, sorry, yeah? I was going to ask you, where is the site that you use? Is there one particular camp that you use all the time or do you move to different we places? Keep more- yeah, we keep moving uh, because we want to impact on the community. So that's why we keep moving and we select. Uh, normally, we choose five places uh, uh, ahead. Then we send the team to do an assessment. For instance, look at the, how close is the community, uh, what the supply, and then we vote it. Uh, democratically, we vote among the uh, committee, and then whichever place is uh, get majority of the vote, that's the one we're gonna prepare for it. Yeah. Fantastic. Then we discuss uh, talking with uh, local authority, like uh, district administrator, um, yeah, the police commander, and we approach and is starting to discuss about the activities. And also with uh, the local youth. So we're starting to do some activities uh, ahead uh, so that they can be prepared. So like now, uh, since last year, uh, we already doing some activities you know, at, the, at the camp that we are uh, planning to do the uh, Premier Youth. So, so that they are aware that's their site is going to be, uh, so they, so we prepare like a, a water conservation activities and we do training on the horticulture, uh, compost making. And so we started to do activities one year before, uh, prior to the camp. Mm. Wow. It's so well organized. My gosh. And it sounds like it's, it's not just workshops, but it's kind of like a, a whole festival event. Like I'm sure you have music yeah, and dancing. Music well. yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, it's like a youth festival because uh, after the workshop, practical workshop in the field, we also have an exhibition, like a, a expo uh, in the campsite. So it's open to public. Mm-hmm. So anyone can come uh, to see and then Starting three o'clock in the afternoon, all participant is uh, free from the practical workshop. So they go back and they have a shower or they clean, and they can uh, participate in some games, um, also some uh, like a, a talk talk show uh, in different uh, expo site. Uh, and then starting six to seven, uh, it's a dinner time. It's a uh, then seven to eight. It's a movie time, so we have screening, big screen, and we play a movie for one hour, like one hour we, we use film, short film, like a 10 to 15 minute uh, film. And then, so one hour, at least we show four film. And, and then eight to 10 is a, a, we call cultural night. So we have big stage, so we have performance, from local to you know all sorts of uh, uh, perform can be performed by the participant or we invite some local artists to perform and mainly it's performed by the participant they they do poem they do theater they do music they do dancing it's a uh, so much uh, uh, it's a one fire like a sometime when 
five days after the camp finished, they don't want to go home. No, they but they don't. Home. So <laughs> can you just, like, where, where did this whole idea come from and, and how did you get it started? Because, you know, it, this is absolutely brilliant, Ego. I mean, this needs to happen in every country. It's such a brilliant idea. How did you get it started? Well, uh, I think uh, after after seeing the the statistic of Timor uh, reading that uh, majority of the population, um, I think seventy percent is uh, the age uh, below thirty years old. So oh, yeah. and so. Therefore, uh, we've been thinking like uh, in terms of the uh, permaculture activities. So it would be great if we focus more on involving the young people, because they're the one will, uh, you know, uh, as an actor, to continue this kind of um, sustainable development in the future. And second, we look at uh, the country after. Uh, uh, post uh, conflict and a lot of uh, trauma. Some, most of the people still have trauma, the anger, uh, especially the youth. Uh, so I think we want to do something that uh, the youth can transfer their all of this uh, emotion, their anger through something creative, uh, more positive. Uh, through uh, uh, permaculture, through art, through uh, painting, or through uh, music. So that's where we create this kind of space so that we can invite this kind of uh, the youth uh, to, you know, share uh, and learning uh, and sharing among each other and also learning uh, from the uh, local community and also from others. Mm. I think there's uh, so many uh, uh, inspiration behind that, uh, but I think the most is uh, we want uh, the the most of the young people is uh, go back to their village and starting the permaculture. So that's why in Timor now permaculture is like a it's growing like a mushroom, and it, I think everywhere, and including the school garden. Uh, just today, uh, we report to the uh, uh, in the gov government meeting this morning. So we report that we established setting up 224 school gardens already uh, in the country. Mm. So for the perma kids, uh, we are inviting the kids coming from this uh, uh, school garden, and also for. Uh, the the young people, the youth that participate in the in the camp, they're not just ordinary uh, uh, youth coming like they just come and they want to become participant, but they have to. One of the rules is they have to uh, uh, active in one of the uh, youth organization mm -hmm. uh, in their uh, area because then easy for us to follow up. So when we contact, we contact the, the organization, we contact the group. And they have so, more possibility for rippling out action right. when they go home. They're not just an isolated. Yeah. So what no, are those no. kind of organizations? What are, what youth organizations exist? They, they in various, various, various organizations. They come from a farmers group organization, uh, also like a religious organization, uh also as uh, we also the uh, deficient uh organization as well uh women's organization as uh, youth organization so many uh, uh organization as long as they they're active in one organization or they've been recommended by uh local uh villages like a leader like a mm. local authority of the village. So it's really like uh, a leadership so camp in a way. Yes, yes. Mm. And so that uh, we could easily uh, follow up later on.
Mm. And uh, the success success story is uh, from the past camp, from the few uh, camp in the past. So already a few of these uh, youth already become a local leader in their respective village. Uh, one of the island near Dili called Atauru Island. Uh, one of the uh, local leader is uh, one one of our uh, like active participants. Now he become local leader, and now he doing water conservation and he ban all the hunting and uh, also organized with the local community like a cleaning up the beach, and so. Now the, the program is not only in one village, but it's like a scaling up in the whole uh, sub-district in, in that island. And we have about, maybe about five, uh, we call Suku, it's like a village. Uh, I guess in Timor we have a uh, uh, sub-village leader, uh, village leader, sub-district, and then district leader. So. It's like a very important uh, uh, leader in the in their community. Mm -hmm. They've been uh, uh, nominated. They've been uh, voted by the people, not mm -hmm. by not appointed. That's amazing, so, and that that then shifts everything, doesn't it? Once you start, to, and so yeah. your strategy of working with young people to cultivate a particular way of being and understanding and practical skills for them yeah. to emerge as young leaders. Who, um, who have been representing other people all that time and then be connected yeah. nationally with all those other leaders and internationally right. too, I suppose, as well. Yeah. So it is like mushrooming. It is like this mycelium network that you've spread across the country. There were these little fruiting bodies popping up all over the place. It's, it's really yeah. powerful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's great. And you mentioned too last time I spoke with you about um how it's also been taken in by the education department and also is it like agriculture department permaculture has found its way into those like national policies as well can you tell us a yeah. little bit more about how that's all going the school garden is now uh, part of the national curriculum so uh it's collaborate with minister of education uh, in timor and that's, it's a compulsory subject for all primary school. Permaculture is a compulsory subject for all primary school? Yeah, for the primary school, yeah. Fantastic. We call permaculture garden. Yep. Uh, and now we start into piloting. Uh, we start into piloting so in the high school. We just starting uh, about five high school, uh, two Catholic high school and one National high school and two public like a high school, so also uh, quite amazing, successful since uh, we started last year, and they starting to show uh, uh, progress because we want to convince Minister of Education to scaling up not only from for primary school, but we want to bring up up to the high school, so every school from primary school up to high school to have school garden. Mm. And so today, I, uh, this morning I attended uh, a meeting at the, in the uh, government. They uh, invite uh, NGO representative. So I'm one of them um, to uh, give our ideas to the uh, government for two and a half years, what should government uh, put in their priority to fix the call economical uh, recuperation after pandemic? Uh, so one of the uh, report we are uh, presenting is we want the school garden to uh, like uh, increase the number to scaling up so that not only we did 224 school garden already, but we want like a more school garden will be great. All the school, uh, school have the garden mm -hmm. and that can be used as a living laboratory for uh, teaching and also for uh, 
helping the local community to improve uh, their uh, home garden to produce nutrition, nutritional um, nutritious food in the local area. Uh, that's the ideas behind the school garden. Not only to produce, so the school, it's not necessary for the school to produce much, but the school garden is as the living laboratory for the kids to learn all the process of permaculture, caring and uh, produce uh, organic material and uh, growing food. And then they, when they go home, together with their parents, they can uh, implement it in their home garden. Fantastic. So and some the, of the, I was going to ask, so type, what types of home gardens have people already got? I mean, uh, is home gardening something that was let go of or is it is there something there and permaculture is another layer on top of what they're doing what what do people normally have around their home i think uh most of the community they have garden they have garden only some some aspect which is missing is you know they normally burn all their uh, organic matter like uh, grass uh, leaves and they pile all the rubbish uh, like uh, unorganic waste together with organic they they burn. So this aspect, after uh, the kids learn from school garden, they go home and they starting to change uh, slowly, slowly. And so they now less uh, burning of organic matter, and they starting to separate organic and unorganic. Mm -hmm. uh, that's like a behavior change mm -hmm. and also they're starting to uh, make their own compost at home and they're doing a uh, rice garden bed which is uh, a lot easier in uh, that they've been they've been doing before so uh, we apply uh, like a teach technique that easy to make garden mm -hmm. and also it's more sustainable for the uh, so this kind of ideas that the local community adopt so quick from the uh, the school. Yeah. And do one. You have, do you have, sorry to interrupt again. <laughs> I've got so many sure. questions for you. Um, do you have like little booklets that you give out to the kids, or there's information that you have? Yes, we have. Uh, we call. Uh, let me show you. I I don't have here. Uh, we call uh, permaculture, uh, permaculture garden for kids. Uh, let me get the book. Yeah, great. Just Thank one. you. So, yeah, this is uh, the book we have. Yeah. Fantastic. And this is like a small manual that we use. So, a lot of illustration about gardening. Oh, how nice. And the step how to do it. And this, um, this is about gardening, yeah. this uh, natural uh, uh, pest control, and this is how they show little about they can make their own uh, uh, organic pesticide if they want. Yeah. And this one shows them about they can produce their own local microorganism. Fantastic. They can. Uh, and also this one as nursery. Great. This one about the nursery yeah. and how to make the nursery and the tools. And this one about the making compost. Yep. Uh, and this one about living fence Brilliant. yep Wonderful. yeah living fence so we encourage every school to grow their own fence and they they can eat their fence we call <laughs> edible fence yep nice and this one about the uh, seed calendar oh great about seed calendar and how to save their own local seeds yep it's just an example and and how to save uh, the seeds and then we also uh, introduced a little bit about vertical garden. Right. 
Ego, is there any way that I can get a copy of that to share with the refugee kids? That is just got absolutely everything in it that is what they need to know. And I know it's in in your language, but I wonder yeah. whether there's a way that it could be trans. Is it already in English, or can we translate it into uh, another language? Or there is already we already translate in English. Only we haven't formatted yet uh, into this uh, same, yeah. Yeah, right. I think I have the word in English. Only, yeah, we haven't had a, don't have a chance yet to ask uh, a graphic designer to format it. Yeah. And I think it's uh, many requests already for this little book. Yeah. Uh, it's so popular, really. Yeah, so, yeah, hopefully we could, uh formatted and then uh, i don't know yet don't know i cannot promise when <laughs> but uh i could send you this uh but it's very hard unless we give it to someone that goes to australia to take to uh, copy right. do you to do you it have it do you have it digitally do you have it on computer as a pdf the digital uh I let I check with my uh, our admin because they're the one kept all this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And great. Then, yeah. Because currently I'm working with a group of people who you know like Rosemary Morrow and a whole lot of people who are trying to look at what kind of resources are available for people in you know young people, school aged people, right. um, something that's really tangible, really visible, a visual, visual. I mean. Right. And in a with materials that are accessible. So that, you know, that is just absolutely um, beautiful the way that you've done it. And so, you know, anyone can pick that up and follow that. That's, yeah. And we also produce a flip chart out of these books for the teachers. Oh, great. Uh, you see uh, this flip chart? Yes, fantastic. Yeah, this for teachers to use. So do you send that out to every every school that's got a school garden program? Each school has a kit of these posters. Is that how you do it? No, we we can't because uh, uh, only uh, for those like when we get sponsorship from the like uh, some agency, then we produce print this to uh, give it to them. Then they can give it to the local school because it's a cost. Yeah. So we kind of we ask the government, but until <laughs> we, so it's very limited. But mm -hmm. I think uh, over a hundred school they get this. It's about nine, nine of them as a package from the book. Mm -hmm. So and then teacher can put on the wall, and then they can teach the kids and explain about the, the what is in the little book. Fantastic. So, so the kids holding this yep. and the teacher uses yep that's just perfect isn't it and and you're finding that's working really well the the teachers i feel like they you know like that combination is has worked really well yeah i can imagine it and, would. yeah yeah it's helped a lot and and then they, they can adjust they can adjust uh, in, because this is just an example that's right. And yeah. they can uh, adjust and go uh, into whatever they have in the local. So it's a very uh, helpful resource for the teachers. Uh, yeah. And some and you, of the, some of school already using uh, school garden for teaching different uh, subject, like they're teaching uh, geometric using you know, asking kids to, uh, you know, measure the size of the garden and also the counting number of plants. And so some of the school and some of the school also using for teaching language. Uh, so the school garden is, has many, many purpose. Yeah. Especially to help the teachers do uh, outside classroom and the kids is uh, more motivated 
in that way because for instance uh, mathematics is a very uh, boring for most of the kids but when the teacher used uh, brought them out to uh, school garden and started to uh, ask them to count plant you know number of colors or you know names or variety or uh, the kids love it they mm. so you know, do they you just... do you have programs uh where you teach the teachers how to use the gardens and how to use your materials so i know you have got programs for yeah. the kids but the teacher education programs is that what you do too yes we run we run workshops for the uh teachers three days three days workshop uh, for the teachers uh, before they start the school garden. So for normally we go to one area, which is not only one school. We start, we start with setting up a model first in one school. Then we inviting like a representative of teachers come from uh, more than 10 schools or up to 20 school or sometime uh, to do uh, a teacher training, three days teacher training, like a workshop. And then including, uh, they're doing gardening uh, during three days and making compost and yeah, we're using all this material to. Yeah, so they understand then, it so then they can teach it on. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So do you yeah. also give them um, your big manual? Do they have that as background or do you, you know, where do you, where does your thousand page manual fit into your whole educational uh, suite of, of things? Uh, manual, not yet. Manual uh, because it's uh, too big and uh, mainly still in English. Uh, oh, hopefully really? we, uh, yeah. yeah. We almost, I think, uh, only two chapter uh, left now for Tetum. And when it's done, I think we have the Tetum translation finished and can be online. But to print it, that to give it to uh, every school, I think is uh, cost a lot. Mm. But we recommend them to access online. Yeah. Only problem that uh, not all team or access to internet. So that's the hard part. Yeah. Do you, do you so also make films? Do you also make films about the, like how to do these different things? Do you send films out with, to the teachers? Uh, no, we only do like a, a just a documentary, like oh, yeah. on water, on school garden, but to film like a how to do things, not yet because we don't we don't have uh, access to kind of funding for to yeah. do that yeah yeah wouldn't that be wouldn't that be great to have that as part of the suite of things but you know this the three day training for teachers that seems like a really critical part of of it yeah so um just uh, on the on the agriculture side um so where does permaculture sit within the agriculture department's thinking? Is there a recognition of permaculture as well as a part of what's happening? For agriculture, for agriculture uh, so far, not, uh, I think now a lot easier because they already see what we, uh, the result that we do. Uh, but still, we still uh, don't have a, what's it called, um, same ideas yet, because they're still uh, influenced by, you know, uh, big scale, uh, modernized. Um, so that's why it's still hard. And uh, the minister also keep changing. Mm. Uh, and those people who don't understand about uh, sustainable agriculture, or permaculture, or agroecology—they they don't have any ideas, and so that's why it's still hard. Maybe one of your but, perma youth will become a minister of agriculture one day. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, that's why we need uh, we need like uh, maybe ten years, hopefully, you know, 
uh, uh, most of our uh, permaculture, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, people will mm -hmm. be uh, taking a uh, leader in many places. I mm. think will change slowly, slowly. Go, but go one, oh, sorry, you go. Yeah. One of the uh, ministry that now is starting to uh, get close to us is uh, Minister of Public Work, uh, especially because they're one of their their portfolio is, is uh, water and sanitation. Um, and we've been critic a lot about they investing a lot in the water water uh, infrastructure, but not putting attention on uh, upstream upstream conservation. So we could now uh, we are in the process of uh, signing a, a memorandum to uh, collaborate on the water conservation activities. And last year, um, Minister of Public Works is the one uh, found Permatil to do uh, training on water and uh, uh, what, water resource conservation. Mm -hmm. And also the other uh, government body that also we collaborate very well is uh, Secretary of State of Youth and Sport. Mm -hmm. So uh, last year uh, we trained the youth group, by uh, youth center, uh, people come by uh, youth from youth, uh, youth center in 13 municipality uh, on horticulture, uh, aquaculture, and animal husbandry mm -hmm. using a permaculture principle. Fantastic. And there are about 120 youth, uh, girls and boys. And 95% of them now implemented. They, they're doing uh, fish pond, uh, they raise chicken, pigs, uh, also they're doing horticulture. So it's a... Uh, so are you finding uh, that this is actually then uh, helping them to create um, better livelihoods for themselves? Is it rippling out into, into that part of their lives as well as just being yes. around food and for, for the family, but it's actually helping them to create uh, a job for themselves Jobs. is that helping yeah. in that way yeah yeah that's that's what we uh being aiming for apart from they producing uh, food for themselves but also create enterprise uh mm -hmm. for themselves so they can create jobs yep because uh timor one of the um, high unemployment rate uh so that's why as I mentioned that, uh, because mostly young people and when they finish uh, school, high school or university, they don't, they don't get a job. Mm. Uh, while 70% uh, of the people living in rural area, they have land, they have water, they have a uh, resource, but everyone wants to have jobs in the office. So this, that, that's why the, the unemployment is very high. So it's, it's forcing government to go and lobby companies like a, a, you know, beverage, like a beer or, you know, soft drink or, you know, uh, to establish a company and government promised that this company will recruit thousand young people or, you know, recruit uh, employ thousand people mm. so it's all about uh, promising uh, without creating something that uh, more sustainable mm -hmm. uh, in their local area yeah so what size of land is, last, oh, sorry I was gonna say what size yeah. of land is typical for people to have like how much land does a family I think, have? Uh, majority of family in Timor at least they have uh, minimum one hectare, like a uh, two acre yep. uh, minimum. And some they get more, uh, uh, but you know, they abandon this, uh, this land. Mm -hmm. um, also, we have 30 
percent of the uh, agricultural land is for rice uh, cultivation. And now I think 90% of the rice body is abandoned because uh, no, no water. Oh. Yeah. So wow. that's why. So where's the rice uh, coming uh, from? Is it all being imported? Imported, all imported. From, from Indonesia? Uh, from, not from Indonesia. Indonesia also having problems. So Vietnam, Thailand and Laos. So mm. therefore we criticize the, the agriculture uh, ministries that a lot of investment is goes into uh, rice production, but they intend to forget about diversifying other crops. So that's and, why we keep you know, yelling, you know? Yeah, and also uh, what you're doing with getting the, you know, looking at the whole water system and restoring the yeah. hydrology of the land, you know, yeah. actually taking a few steps back and doing that work so that then that's right. you can restore the water we, system, yeah, to, to rehydrate right. yeah. the landscape. It makes so much sense. Well, I, yeah. hope they, I hope they listen to you. My gosh, it makes perfect sense to... <laughs> <laughs> to yeah. hear what you're doing yeah so yeah that's why yeah, i think uh, slowly slowly the some of the government uh leader or politician they starting to aware uh, of uh, what we've been doing uh especially uh permaculture around uh, permaculture agroecologic and uh, starting i think uh, slowly slowly spreading uh, throughout the uh, policy of the government mm -hmm. and hopefully uh, in few years time uh, will be a lot more uh, happening in terms of uh, yeah sustainable agriculture or permaculture yeah what and about I'm the sure, impact uh, I was going to ask you what about the impact of climate change on on your country and and is that uh, being a, a catalyst for people to think differently about perhaps using permaculture and more regenerative strategies? Yeah, I think uh, the climate change is happening, is impact as well on Timor as an island country. Uh, one uh, impact is water scarcity. Mm -hmm. So many uh, people uh, not access to uh, clean water. Many springs dries out. Many rivers uh, also dries out. When rains come, only uh, many springs function when rains come. But also when heavy rain come, causing a lot of uh, a disaster as well because of we loss of uh, forests mm -hmm. in many parts of the uh, Timor. People uh, cut down the forest, uh, burning, and that's increased the, um, what's it called, extend the dry season. Mm -hmm. uh, like we just have a, a devastate uh, flooding last uh, March, which is uh, Dili, some part of Dili is uh, a lot of impact and people lost, uh, destroyed the house and so much damage. Mm -hmm. That's because uh, again, we keep advising the uh, Minister of Public Work that we need to, uh, you know, create a catchment system uh, on top of the uh, upstream so that to, to slow down the water flow during heavy rain or rainy season. And the water can recharge back to the ground mm -hmm. to feed the, the spring and feed, feed the groundwater. Absolutely. So, so we again and again keep repeating, you know. So then we have to go and do do it by ourselves, mm -hmm. and then invite them to see it. Yeah. Now, uh, those areas that we're working on uh, less uh, damage because uh, all the uh, water is uh, captured uh, in the upper land. And then it's uh, slowed down the water flow into the uh, lowland. Fantastic! That's brilliant. I just, we're just, just on the continuity of the 
uh, the education theme and particularly with regards to learning about all of this and how to restore landscapes. Is any of, any of this education entering into the universities or is it particularly something that is being learned just by getting out with you and your teams and going out into the landscape? Is, has permaculture reached the university level, I guess is the question that I'm asking, or is that not such an important thing? Is it more important just to get the teams out there? Well, uh, actually, it's a, it's a high demand. It's a high demand uh, from the university uh, for us to uh, teach at the university. Yeah. Like I myself, I, I've been teaching at the National University since 2011. Uh, on uh, introducing a, we call a sustainable agriculture slash permaculture. Uh, but so then because of so many uh, activities that I have to uh, dealing with, so now I don't go teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, but some of the uh, university still sending their student to most of the formative activities. Yeah. Uh, last year, uh, they sending a student to the youth camp, to water camp, and they involving in the, you know, digging the reservoir. So it's part of their, uh, their lesson. So do but, they get credits to their, to their degree from coming out and doing water camp, youth camp? Is yeah. that part of? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, it's part of the credit. Uh, last celebrating uh, the World Day uh, Water Day uh, in Timor, uh, Permatil organized uh, water camp uh, in March, and so many uh, university students attend the water camp. Uh, three days water camp. And during water camp, we discuss and we uh, do practical activities and we're planting a couple thousand trees around the reservoir. And so, and this still, uh, we're hoping to, you know, continue and continue and build up. Uh, and we discuss, and also, I think just a matter, just a matter of human resource like a matter of human resource to, uh, we could deploy to different uh, university to teach. Even uh, Ministry of Education is asking me if I could develop a material on water conservation to include in the next uh, curriculum reform for the high school. Mm. And because, you know, so I myself, I don't, you know, so many uh, things on my plate so you know have you what can have, i do have you <laughs> you're doing a remarkable amount oh my gosh i don't know how yeah. you hold this together i mean do you have a a good team are there many other people like you who've risen up through kind of permaculture practical work who you can collaborate with around the country or have, what's the same well, permaculture scene like or uh for uh, practical uh, teaching, we have now we have over 50 uh, volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, over 50 volunteers that are ready to deploy anywhere, you know, to do school garden, water conservation, and uh, they they ready anytime as long as we support their transport and, uh, you know, give them uh, some lump sum for food mm -hmm. and they ready to uh, deploy anywhere. But in terms of writing, writing uh, curriculum, writing material for the uh, university or for the, uh, uh, the government, it's not many people. Like uh, uh, you can count not even five finger yeah. in, in the institution. Yeah. So, so I'm the one who have to force myself to you know, uh, think uh, outside of the box to try to contribute uh, whatever I can. Yeah. Mm. I was just going to ask you, what, 
what can the international permaculture community uh, do to support you or how can they find out more about what you're doing, but not so much to come and, you know, take it, but like, how can they come to support what you're doing? Is there a way that you would appreciate some kind of more backing or support from the global permaculture community? Yeah, I think uh, I'm sure uh, there is many people want to support. Um, only one uh, barrier is the language, uh, because language has become uh, a barrier. But I'm, uh, but I'm sure, like uh, many permaculture uh, friends around the globe, they they want to support. Uh, but I, I always say, you know, please had a chance, come visit Timor so you can understand uh, about the, the culture or about the, the climate. So then you can, I can contribute in the, in the proper way. Yeah. But I think just to uh, maybe emphasize uh, in supporting other way is to keep promoting the ideas, I think that's another way that uh, can help a lot, uh, especially for our uh, government and politicians. Uh, you know, they prefer they prefer listen to you know someone that work for the World Bank or, or ADB or you know uh, in international uh, agents like uh, from. Uh, German agency or Japanese agency or uh, rather than listen to a local person or you know Timorese <laughs> because that I think it's it's happening all over the uh, the world think that it's something that uh, come from outside is the best but sometimes it's good sometimes it's good but sometimes uh, for instance I don't trust like our uh, people like uh, from World Bank or ADB, you know, another way is to influence the uh, the government in the wrong way. Mm. That's that's happening all over, you know, uh, like uh, Asia Pacific or even African countries. Mm. Uh, it's create just create a disaster. Absolutely. But people coming from a permaculture organization, uh, I think we we speak in the same language. If we, we, we all speak the same language, and I'm sure, uh, you know, people will, uh, the government, especially the politicians will listen. Mm. Uh, like now the book, uh, the manual is uh, now being downloading in many countries. Now, uh, when people, uh, Timris see on Facebook, that something come from Timor can be uh, spreading. They starting to listen. What, yeah. uh, why, why this happening? And they starting to asking a lot of questions. How you do it? And um, before they never, you know, they they ignore and they uh, how say, uh, yeah, they don't listen to you. Or well, just not think that it's as. <laughs> Value, but you know, say eighty-two thousand downloads of the chapters of your book globally. That's phenomenal. Right. You know, that's yeah. that's well up there in global bestseller numbers. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. a it's really yeah. spreading out everywhere. And um and you know, as much as I can refer to it as well and and share it with people in all different countries, because you know, I work in mostly tropical and subtropical climate so it's so valuable and because it's so visual it's just absolutely brilliant what a amazing resource that you've created so i, I mean i'm wondering whether there's a way to um through through your organization you've now created permatil global is that right oh, that's, yeah yeah and yeah, so that's right. yeah. I, i'll put some links down below for people to maybe get some information about that but if they were to um like is, does it help to receive donations is that helpful for you yeah. to do your work to spread your work out further? Yeah, I think uh, the ideas of starting a Permatil Global is um, again to spread uh, 
some good ideas that Timor can share with the uh, rest of the globe. But also we uh, want to create uh, a foundation that, you know, we could share among each other. Uh, hopefully, you know, uh, this can help. But also we try to uh, raise uh, some fund that to help Permatil TL to scaling up scaling up uh, the program in Timor so that we could create Timor as a, as a model. Uh, not completely can be duplicated in other country, but some of the technique or some of the strategy or some of the ideas can be copied. And of course, we are willing to support uh, any organization or any country that want to uh, see them, this model work. And we are we we willing to uh, advise or give our uh, technical assistance, but of course, uh, yeah, we want to uh, hear from uh, how they want to learn from Timor. Yeah. Mm. Fantastic. Well, I, I can just already see the direct links with what you're doing and the the Perma Youth groups in in our. Uh, in the refugee camps in Uganda and, and Kenya right. and some of the villages there as well. Uh, so for youth from the, what you're calling the kids age, but also um, the older group as well, it's right. absolutely so relevant and so important and, 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 and inspiring as well. Like this is what's possible. You know, you've been doing this for, well, how long now? How many, it, well over a decade that you've yeah, been. Uh, 12, 12 years now. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and so to see where you can take it and, and how you can start to make changes uh, yeah. at a community level in schools and in governments and, and really uh, open it up, open up wide. And I know, like you're saying, there's still so much to do, but you've done an incredible amount already. It's really, really inspiring. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we also have some uh, video, some uh, documentary, like a, uh, which is we try to uh, make subtitle in English. Uh, one is the Burma Youth uh, Camp. Yeah. Uh, from last uh, time, 2018. Uh, hopefully, if we have that, uh, we could share it with you. Uh, probably we could put on the Permatil Global website. And also the other one, documentary on water uh, conservation as well and and we very happy to hear that uh, Perma Youth is about to starting in, in in Uganda that's uh, I mean when you text me I I, I tell uh, my some of my colleagues you know uh, Perma Youth uh, starting in other country already yeah and and there's this group that are meeting every week now using the using this platform of zoom where there's yeah. uh, there's a, a girl in zanzibar there's the kids in um uganda there's uh, people from sweden philippines thailand i wonder whether there's any young uh, people in timor that would would like to join up every every sunday they meet they're starting to meet yeah. do you know of any people who have access to zoom who'd be interested in joining these I'm sure uh, we could facilitate that. I think uh, uh, we only for uh, the Perma Youth, we could facilitate. And so some of uh, this, some of our volunteer that involved in organizing the next uh, Perma Youth Camp. Oh, yeah. So they would, yeah, they would love to, to join this kind of meeting. Uh, only, uh, let me try to find someone that uh, capable to speak English. Okay. <coughs> the other thing would be if there's someone who's like a young person who, oh, or even yourself, to to actually drop in and speak to the young people. So we often um, invite guests to come in and speak with the perma youth and to hear right. and to to inspire them. So you know whether it be yourself or one of the other young leaders who would. Right, right speak to them that would be fantastic yeah i think uh we also have other uh permanent leader in uh permatil yep. or also in Timor. 
uh, we have some uh, female female uh, leader. So I think they are also willing uh, to share. Oh, uh, we have we have uh, my Armenia. She speak uh, good English. She is one of the uh, pioneer of uh, Burma youth as well, and, and also few others that can join in. But I'm, uh, if I have time, I could, you know, I'd love to join one day. I know you my, Sorry, say that again. Only my my laptop, my computer, uh, I don't know what's wrong. I have to update it, uh, probably the program, or I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, normally, the, my Zoom, Zoom is working on my, my computer, mm. but because of my, the computer uh, didn't work, so that's why I borrow uh, my college uh, laptop. So mm. that's why the, the name appears, Mena. Is, Mena, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Mena is the, this is, this is one of the pioneers of Burma Youth. She's a female, uh, one of the uh, senior uh, staff of Burma Youth. Yeah, oh, well, thanks, Mena, for lending, yeah. <laughs> lending it. Well, uh, thanks so much for you. I've got, you know, I could keep talking to you, Rage, but I know you've got so much to do and it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you and uh, so much inspiration and uh, so many great ideas that, you know, I'm, I'm really delighted to be able to help ripple out the idea of Perma Youth to other places. And I remember speaking with you, like I said, a couple of years ago at the Permaculture Conference and we had a little right. chat on, on video then and, and then as well, feeling absolutely inspired by what you're doing. So, you know, it's what you're doing in, in, in Timor-Leste is, is infecting the world with this positive approach. And, um, yeah, thank you is all I can say <laughs> over thank and over. You. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes I'm watching uh, your uh, video as well on gardening. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, on Facebook, yeah. Yeah. yeah, great. Um, I've just started a podcast as well. So I'm sort of just trying to find ways to, to share permaculture in as many different ways as possible. You know, for people to right. hear, for people to watch, for kids to get involved in. We're organizing just a little camp here in the next month. Um, no way oh, to like a thousand, but, you know, we'll start small and, and build, it, build it up as we go. Yeah, it starts from a, a small, yeah. yeah, like a growing seed. That's exactly right, yeah. Oh, it's been lovely to see you and to chat with you and thanks for taking the time and, and persisting even though we kind of dropped out a few times. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's okay. So say, right. say hello to everyone and I will. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's been lovely to see you. Thanks, Echo. Yeah, yeah. Cheers. Bye bye. 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 So thanks for tuning in to the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast today. It's been a real pleasure to have your company. I invite you to subscribe and receive notification of each new weekly episode with more wonderful stories, ideas, inspiration and common sense for living and working regeneratively. And call positive permaculture thinking and design into action in this changing world. I'm including a transcript below and a link also to my four-part permaculture series, really looking at what is permaculture and how to make it your livelihood too. So join me again in the next episode where we talk with another fascinating guest. I look forward to seeing you there.